How's it going, everyone? This is Aaron from Conspiracy Crunch. Thank you very much for clicking on this video. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. I just want to say apologies about the audio quality on this video. Like the, uh, the microphone might sound a little bit echoey, may sound a little bit DIY. I do apologize for that. Uh, basically, I don't have a proper mic set up at the moment, so I have to use my phone. It's not ideal, but I really wanted to get this video out to you as quickly as possible, and this is the best way to do it. So thank you very much for tuning in. If you're familiar with the channel and you've been here before, also thank you for coming back and sticking with us while we've been on a bit of a break. There will be more videos coming in future, and hopefully you enjoy this one, and I'll see you on future episodes. There has been plenty of criticism against the decision to host the World Cup in Qatar. Opposition to the Qatar World Cup has been rife since they were announced as hosts over a decade ago, with criticism ranging from their use of hard labour to build stadiums, their stance on gay rights and the ban of alcohol sales. Unless you're a VIP sponsor, of course. People in favour of the Qatar World Cup have responded by calling Western nations hypocrites and accusing them of trying to force their standards onto other cultures. Regardless of your position on this particular point, that's not what we're going to be talking about today. In this video, I will argue that the entire Qatar World Cup has been rigged from day one to ensure that Argentina and Portugal will play each other in the final. Firstly, let's look at what's happened so far. As I'm recording this, Argentina and Australia are playing. I'm so confident that Argentina are going to win. I'm carrying on with this recording anyway. So firstly, let's look at what's happened so far, as I said. Starting from the very beginning in 2010. Qatar emerged as the unlikely World Cup host bid winners on the 2nd of December 2010, beating competition from the likes of South Korea, Japan, Indonesia, Australia, and now 2026 hosts the United States. Qatar won the bid despite only three of their 12 proposed stadiums actually existing at the time of their bid being accepted, and the fact they'd have to reschedule the tournament to winter due to the country's climate. Immediately, people started to question how this happened, and soon the cat was out of the bag. In May 2011, just six months after Qatar won the bid, two bribery allegations are tabled by Lord Trisman of the English FA against senior members of FIFA. When talking to a UK Parliament inquiry in 2011, Lord Trisman alleged that Trinidad and Tobago's Jack Warner had demanded four million US dollars for an education centre to be built in his country, while Paraguay's Nicholas Layaus asked for an honorary knighthood in exchange for voting in Qatar's favour. Plus, two British reporters testified in the inquiry that Jack Anuma of the Ivory Coast and Issa Hayato of Cameroon were each paid 1.5 million US dollars to support the Qatari bid. It was also revealed that a well-supported push for a revote on the 2022 World Cup in 2011 was suppressed by FIFA and specifically FIFA president at the time, Sepp Blatter. In the years that followed, many of these allegations would migrate from rumour into hard fact. Seb Blatter was found guilty of widespread corruption allegations in 2015 relating to both the 2018 and 2022 World Cups. As a result, he was banned from participation in football for eight years by the FIFA Ethics Committee. The previously mentioned Jack Warner was also indicted for corruption in 2015, as were six other members of the FIFA Voting Committee. These included Michael Platini of France, Ricardo Texiera of Brazil, Chuck Blazer of USA, Warari Makudi of Thailand, Nicolas Leal of Paraguay, who we've already mentioned, and Rafael Salguero of Guatemala. To make this allegation even more obvious, Qatar's representative on the FIFA voting board, Mohammed bin Haman, was banned for life from footballing activities in 2011 on the grounds of ethics violations. Why is this all important, I hear you ask? Well, there's no use trying to uncover conspiracy if you can't prove how it was done. These bribery allegations not only show us what FIFA and Qatar have done, but it also shows us how they have done it. But I digress. Let's go back to the original point of Argentina versus Portugal. The evidence of a setup first of all comes from the Qatar World Cup draw. Argentina were drawn into Group C alongside Saudi Arabia, Poland and Mexico, while Portugal were drawn into Group H with Ghana, South Korea and Uruguay. Given the structure of the tournament, this meant if Argentina and Portugal both won their groups, then the only stage they could play each other at during the World Cup would be the final. Lo and behold, Argentina managed to win their group despite a shock opening game defeat to Saudi Arabia, while Portugal also won their group and were already guaranteed qualification with a game still to play. It wasn't easy though, and you could argue that both teams needed a bit of help. Firstly, Portugal earned and scored a controversial penalty in their 3-2 win against Ghana. 
VAR did not check the on-field decision despite strong protests from the Ghanaian players. Then, Argentina were also awarded a soft penalty by VAR against Poland after they overruled the referee's on-field decision. Despite the fact Messi's penalty was saved for Argentina, Argentina won 2-0 and Poland also qualified on goal difference. An interesting side point for you here. Mexico criticised Messi over footage which appeared to show him kicking a Mexican jersey that was on the Argentine dressing room floor after Mexico and Argentina had played their group stage match. In the following match, Mexico were eliminated by a 91st minute Saudi Arabia goal which allowed Poland to advance instead of Mexico on goal difference. Were Mexico eliminated for criticising FIFA's golden boy? Okay, I admit that last one is clutching the straws a little bit, but the point about easy penalties and VAR favours to ensure Argentina and Portugal won their groups remains. So the scene is set for Ronaldo and Messi. The only way two of the greatest players of all time and the faces of this modern footballing generation will ever get their one showdown is if both their nations make it all the way to the final. But how will FIFA ensure this happens? Football is unpredictable and full of huge upsets everywhere you look. Well, here's your solution. Enter VAR. When VAR was introduced, it was meant to overturn clear and obvious errors, which were made by the on-field official. But what we now see is that when VAR officials need to look at footage, the level of their scrutiny tends to depend on which team is actually involved. If VAR wants to find a reason to disallow a goal, they will. If VAR wants to find a reason to give a penalty, they will. If VAR wants to find a reason to send someone off, well, they will. No matter how hard they have to look, how much they have to ignore, or how ridiculous of a decision it may seem, they'll always find a way to get the result they want when it matters most. But the whole tournament isn't decided in the group stages, of course. The knockout stages are the real business end of the World Cup. Interestingly, genuine threats to teams like Portugal and Argentina, such as Belgium, Germany and heavily fancy dark horses Denmark, have already been eliminated in favour of less usual names in the knockout stages, such as Morocco, Japan and Australia. Going into the final group stage game, Argentina knew that winning the group would set them up for a game against underdogs Australia in the round of 16, while finishing second would see them take on defending champions France. As previously established, Argentina won their group after defeating Poland and will face Australia next, or in fact, as I'm speaking to you right now, meaning they avoid the much tougher opponent who eliminated them in 2018. Fun fact, the only other time Australia have been eliminated from the round of 16 at a World Cup was in 2006, when they lost 1-0 to the eventual champions, Italy. Perhaps this is a bit of foreshadowing and fortune for Argentina going forward. Speaking of foreshadowing, Messi and Ronaldo posted this chess picture to their Instagrams at the start of the World Cup. Is it a mere coincidence or was this intention from the very outset? Now that we've established the how, when and the what, we move on to why. Why would FIFA and Qatar rig the biggest sporting event in the world to ensure that Argentina and Portugal face each other in the final? Another easy answer for you. Messi versus Ronaldo is a big deal, even at the most regular of occasions. But with both of them going head-to-head one last time in the world's biggest match with the only trophy that has eluded both men hanging in the balance, it will be the stuff dreams are made of for football fans. But more importantly, Messi v Ronaldo is money. And a lot of it. That element combined with a phenomenon that is the FIFA World Cup final would be too good to refuse for companies looking for a large-scale marketing and advertising exposure. Brazil spent $19.7 billion in preparation for the 2014 World Cup. Russia spent $16 billion in 2018. But Qatar spent an eye-watering $229 billion US dollars in preparation for 2022. Qatar and FIFA quite simply have to make that money back somehow. And a Messi v Ronaldo final is a certain cash cow. The money involved in that match would make the advertising at the Super Bowl look like an ad section in the back of a local newspaper. Hell, it would make WrestleMania look like a bingo hall indie show. The amount of money that match will earn FIFA in TV revenue, betting money, advertising, sponsorship, merchandise is essentially uncountable and dare I say, irresistible. Also, what better way to stamp out any criticisms of the Qatar World Cup by making it the stage of Messi v Ronaldo for the last time? the biggest time. How could anyone criticise a tournament which gave us the final showdown between the two greatest players of the 21st century and allow one of them to finally claim the richest prize in all of world football? In one single sweep, 
FIFA will make the tainted bribery looming over the tournament vanish. Qatar will make the controversies of their stadium construction mere footnotes in the tournament's history. And in exchange, the world would see arguably the biggest football match of all time. But at what cost? Fact of the matter is, football has become a secondary factor in its own domain. Football isn't about football. Football is about money. And every crumb of the last two World Cups has proven that the working class game has been undisputedly franchised and weaponized by the super wealthy. But I don't blame Russia and Qatar for this. Russia and Qatar aren't the cause of these conditions. They're the results of them. Footballing history, infrastructure, ethics, human rights, none of them matter if you want to host a World Cup. Because in FIFA's eyes, all you need is money. Players have become walking billboards. Fans are commodities and clubs have become franchises. Football is all about money, and that, my good friends, is the real sad truth about football. Hi again, everyone. Just wanted to say thank you very much for listening to this video. Uh, if you've made it this far, you might as well leave a like and subscribe. Uh, leave a comment as well to let me know what you think. Share it with your friends. Get this video out there and let me know how you feel about this new format that we're doing with the videos at the moment. We normally go for a more podcasty feel, but I wanted to go for something that's a bit more, a bit more interactive this time. So I hope you like it. Uh, again, apologies for the audio quality throughout this video. We will be going for a more professional sound on future videos. But like I said, I've had to rush this one out a little bit. We will be taking more time over future episodes. So this one, the audio quality isn't ideal. I'm not a big fan of it, but it is just for now. So thank you very much for listening once again. And hopefully I will see you further down the line.